comedian Rita Redner said, I love being married. It's so great to find that one special person you want to annoy for the rest of your life. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> and here in Hungary, you know about the challenges of marriage, right? I learned uh, in my research that the marriage rate here began declining in about 1970, and it continued to go down before it bottomed out in 2010, when twice as many marriages ended as new ones were created. But in the decades since, there's been a shift here. And in fact, the marriage rate has seen the biggest spike since the big boom that followed World War II, and is in fact now above the EU average. Okay, so the question becomes, why? Why does anyone enter into this crazy arrangement at all? Because it's crazy. Uh, some do it for security, right? Some do it for companionship. Some do it because someone else asked and everyone else was doing it and it seemed like a really good idea at the time. Uh, some still do it because their families arranged it and that's the end of the discussion. But regardless of the reason, the premise is always the same, right? It's always the same. You promise to love this one person unconditionally until you die. No matter what the universe throws at you. And even if you've never even attempted to assemble a piece of IKEA furniture together yet, okay? The title of this session is 10,000 Days, which I was told is roughly the amount of weekday time you can expect to spend with a spouse or life partner over the course of your life. And um, since I don't know any married people who get weekends off, I did a little math and it's actually closer to 14,000. But just for fun, let's stick with the 10,000. Okay, 10,000. 10. Thousand. Days. 10,000 days of looking at the same aging face, of listening to the same stories, of hearing the same jokes, of having the same arguments over and over. I don't know if you know this, but that's a long time, okay? And, and honestly, it's no wonder that the global divorce rate hovers between 40 and 50%. Okay, those aren't good odds, 40 to 50%, they're not good odds, okay? But millions of us go for it every year anyway. Are we just eternal optimists? Well, I'm, I'm gonna be one of the lucky ones, right? Is, is, is that what it is, why, why we think we're gonna beat that? No, no, we do it because we're in love, right? We're in love and love conquers all. Except, as my colleague was just mentioning, for most of human history, marriage had nothing to do with love, nothing at all. It was a financial arrangement. It was a political move. It was a way of keeping royal bloodlines intact, okay? When, when hunter-gatherers began settling down into agrarian societies, marriage was this really convenient way for a man to know which kid belonged to him so that he could put them to work in the fields, right? That was really convenient for a farmer. And you better believe if his wife couldn't produce a huge strapping herd of farmers for him, he was totally welcome to trade her in for a more fertile model. Like he was not stuck with her. It, was, it wasn't exactly the stuff of a Drew Barrymore movie, okay? It was not. This notion that we have today of romantic love of choosing a partner based on, you know, compatibility and attraction. That's historically relatively new. And maybe that's why we're still not very good at it, right? Or maybe it's because when we promise to be true to one other human being forever, <laughs> forsaking all the others, we forget this one tiny little detail. And that is that monogamy is a totally unnatural state. That is a true story. In fact, only about 
4% of the 5,000 mammals on the planet even attempt a modified version of it, okay? The rest of them shack up from anywhere from a single sexual fling. Sometimes they hang out till the kids leave the nest or the den. And then it's right back to the side-swiping single life, okay? In, in the eternally committed camp, you got your beavers, some bats, not all of them, and geese. I know he's so cute, right? And you're going to love him more when I tell you that if half a goose couple dies, the surviving partner never mates again. Ever. Not even one time in a drunken stupor at his best friend's bachelor party. Never. Okay? That kind of loyalty is not in our genetic makeup. It just isn't. Human beings were put on this earth for one reason. To populate it with gusto and diversity. And the way we do that is by spreading our seed as far and wide as we possibly can. Which is why till death do us part, sometimes feels like a really long time, right? It also can feel like a really long time because guess what? We're living a lot longer, a lot longer than we used to, right? Back in the day, till death do us part, it might have been a few years. If you were miserable, you could always console yourself with the fact that, yeah, you'd be out of it pretty soon. Chances are. But thanks to science and technology adding decades to our lives, till death do us part can mean 50 or 60 years or more. How on earth are we supposed to know what we're going to want or who we're going to be or who we're going to want to be with in the year 2069? Okay? I have an analogy that I love to use to illustrate the absurdity of forever, okay? I want everybody to imagine you decide it's time to get a new phone. But right before you head out to the phone store, you find this crazy new law just went into effect, literally today. It, it seems that the very next phone you buy will be the last phone you will ever be allowed to own. You will not even be able to use another phone, okay? You might get in trouble for looking at another phone, okay? So you're going to be really careful picking out your forever phone, right? You're going to bypass dozens of models that maybe come kind of close, but they don't have all the features, and you want all the features. But if you look hard enough and try out enough phones, you will find it, okay? You will find your dream phone, this thing is gorgeous, it feels so good in your hand, and you can't wait for your friends to see you with it. But before you pour the champagne, I want you to ask yourself how you think you're going to feel about it in 50 or 60 years when the screen is all cracked and none of the features work anymore, and it is literally impossible to update the operating system. Okay? It's absurd. It's absurd. And yet, millions of us go for it every year anyway. And it turns out it's a really good thing that we do, that, ma- that we haven't let marriage die off yet. Because it turns out marriage is incredibly beneficial, not just to societies, but to each one of us as an individual, incredibly beneficial. When you compare married people to their single friends, they come out across the board on top, on every single category you can think of, okay? We are thinner. We make more money. I could literally stop right there and every person in this room would be sold on it, right? But that is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? We're healthier, physically and emotionally. We report significantly lower levels of stress and depression. We're less likely to develop heart disease and more likely to survive cancer. We produce happier, healthier, wealthier, more stable, more successful children. We even live longer, which can be good or bad, right? Depending on who you marry. 
But I know what you're thinking. Yay! Marriage is good for me. So is exercising and drinking kale juice. But it's not always easy to get excited about things that are good for you, right? I know that. You know that. But it turns out you actually can get excited for those 87,000 days of togetherness. And today I'm going to tell you how. And it starts with choosing the right person. I know, you, you laugh, right? That sounds so obvious. Oh, <laughs> when you are drunk on hormones and passion, it is so easy to overlook someone else's flaws or make excuses for them. And we all do it. Oh, he's only mean when he drinks and he only drinks when he's really stressed out. Or, yeah, she likes to spend more money than she has, but I'm gonna totally teach her how to budget. Okay, here's a little secret, people. They're called warning signs for a reason. And a vast majority of people who have left unhappy marriages fully admit that they saw blinding, neon, marquee size warning signs before they tied the knot. But they went through with it anyway, okay? Taylor Swift said it best, haters gonna hate. What does she mean? People are who they are. Liars lie, spenders spend, cheaters cheat. The mistake is thinking that if you love someone passionately enough, you can change them or they'll even want to. Okay, that's the mistake. I'm not saying people can't change. They do it all the time. But I'm saying that if you base the biggest decision of your life on the vague possibility of potential change down the line, you are going to be disappointed, okay? So obviously the solution is simple. It's simple, right? You just need to find your soulmate. The one person who was put on this earth expressly to meet each one of your every physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, sexual need, right? Right, we just have to find that person. I mean, 90% of us admit that's what we think marriage is. We have to go out and find that person. And that makes me feel like a big jerk being up here on this stage right now and having to break it to you here today that there is no such thing as a soulmate. There is no such thing. It is a lie, okay? There are seven and a half billion people on the planet, okay? So what do you think are the odds that each one of us, you and I, we're each like this oddly shaped little pot that's supposed to go out into that great big world and find the one tiny but equally odd shaped lid that fits us perfectly and that will just happen to be dancing in the same nightclub or sitting in the same church pew or watching the same football match and we'll just meet and fall into each other's arms. The notion of destiny is dangerous because when people buy into this and then things go south in the relationship and things always go south every time. They never don't go south for at least a little bit. When people believe in their soulmate, what do they do? They quit. They give up. Oh, (laughs) I guess he wasn't my soulmate after all because all that stuff happened. You know, it's bad. They, they don't have to take any responsibility for their part in it. Okay, it's the couples who understand that all relationships will have ups and downs and that conflict is actually an amazing opportunity to grow as people and as a couple who are going to make it. Those are the couples who are going to make it. But they don't talk about conflict in the fairy tales they feed us as kids, right? No, here's what they tell us. And then the handsome prince kissed the beautiful princess and they lived happily ever after. What? What? He never once forgot to call and say he was gonna be late for dinner? She puts the cat back on the toothpaste every single time? Neither of their parents ever come to visit. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's another lie. 
There is no such thing as happily ever after, okay? The truth is, marriage takes commitment. It takes patience. So much patience. (laughs) And it takes work. And the work is not trying to be perfect or trying to convince the other person how they need to change to make you happy, okay? The work is in showing up every single day and making your effort to balance out the inevitable bad, there will be bad, with as much good as is humanly possible, okay? That's the work. And that's not like a generic throwaway line, okay? After decades of research, many, much uh, by my esteemed colleagues here in the front row, marriage experts have determined what they call a magic ratio, okay? They actually call it that that separates the happiest couples from the unhappiest couples. And the ratio is five to one. If you remember nothing else I tell you today, remember this. This five to one is a reflection of the number of positive to negative interactions this couple will experience, but in particular, during conflict. And I don't know if I made it clear yet, there will be conflict. There will always be conflict, okay? But for every slammed door, rolled eye, refusal to talk, or unkind word, the happy couples instinctively know to balance it out with five or more positive gestures. Those can be a simple acknowledgement, a love note tucked into a note, I mean, into a briefcase or a purse, an apology, gratitude for something you think your partner should be doing anyways, but a little thank you, it won't kill you. Okay, and five is the bare minimum. It's actually been proven that the more positivity you intentionally infuse into your relationship, the happier and more stable it will be. Something that won't make it happier or more stable, social media. I know, nobody likes to hear it. I love it. We all love it. It's, I mean, how else are you going to keep up with celebrities and like what your friends had for lunch? But the problem is... When you spend hours a day looking through these picture-perfect feeds, you know what happens? Her partner loves her more. She's got better abs. She eats at nights at restaurants. Her house is nicer. Her kids are better, better behaved. It's another lie, okay? It, it has been proven that there is a direct and inverse relationship between not just relationship satisfaction, but life satisfaction, okay, based on how much time you spend on social media. So, yes, we're going to use it to keep up with our celebrities and our friends and what they had for lunch, but we're not going to judge our own experience by it if we want any chance of being happy, okay? And this is the part you're going to hate even more, sorry, but it's my job. It's not even just social media. As bad as social media is for all the comparing reasons, the bigger threat to all of our relationships right now in this time in history is the vehicles we consume it on constantly. The latest studies say we're on our phones 12 hours a day, sometimes more, okay? I, I mean, you see couples on dates Families in the park, friends at parties, it's hard to find one person without their face in a screen anymore. And considering the fact that 90% of communication is nonverbal, how much meaningful interaction is happening anymore? We all know that, oh, I just, I just need to check this one thing. I just, just one, I just check this one thing. All right, I just send this one email. It's going to take two seconds. That can turn into five hours of mindless scrolling. We all know that. What we don't know is how much richer our relationships would be if we chose to turn these devices off and spend that time connecting with our loved ones, okay? So basically, everything I've told you today, everything comes down to choices. You have a choice in every, every part of your relationship, from who you choose to how it plays out at the end of the day, okay? And even if you choose to take all of the advice you've been given today, all of it. I'm gonna tell you something right now. Marriage will still not be easy 
I even titled one of my books, if it was easy, they'd call the whole damn thing a honeymoon, right? It's not. It's a different thing. There's a wedding, there's a marriage, there's a honeymoon. The marriage is not the easy one. It's not. But if you do choose a solid partner, not a perfect one, but a loving one that's willing to grow with you, marriage can be rich and rewarding, okay? It's good for your mind, your body, your soul, your bank account, your waistline, Okay, it forces you to answer some difficult questions. Like, is it that important that he leaves whiskers in the sink? Or that she likes 17 different kinds of shampoo in the shower? And more importantly, what are we going to have for dinner for the next 9,987 nights? The late psychologist, Dr. Joyce Brothers said, marriage isn't just spiritual communion. It's also remembering to take out the trash. It's the couples who understand the importance of both who will be happiest. Thank you.